uh, get their hands on, right? And sort of going through the history with the, the Coleman Young uh, administration. And then I tried to look at the Blight Removal Task Force report uh, to get inside the psyche of development, right? And oftentimes these reports uh, are helpful because uh, the writers are very sincere, right? I think it's another part of the mystery and sort of, of difficulty sometimes is that people are operating in their own worldview uh, and oftentimes are not aware of their own worldview. Uh, and they project that worldview into their reports, right? So actually by reading their reports, you can get inside the mind of the developer and understand what their value systems are, what their beliefs are, right? Uh, and we tried to then situate some of the modern things happening in Detroit from that lens, right? And I tried to think about three important documents that have defined where we're at now. Uh, one was Detroit Future City, right? Uh, and how many people remember the whole controversy around Detroit Future City? Right? And respectfully, we can have respectful disagreements with good people that are working on all sides. Uh, we had the Blight Removal Task Force report, right? Uh, and then we had the Bankruptcy Plan of Adjustment, right? And if you kind of juxtapose those three documents, you can see a lot of ways in which they are imagining themselves uh, what development is going to look like in the city. Uh, and it all goes around land. So one of those maps that I gave you about Detroit Future City was looking at low vacancy areas and everything was pivoting around the low vacancy or the, the low occupancy areas. Uh, and planning where that's not going to have any future residential space. Uh, and then we said, well, how are you going to get all of that private land, highly parcelized land, uh, into the public domain? And we started to look at a lot of things that sometimes look like they're good things, right? Uh, but are actually part of a broader pattern, right? So think about nuisance abatement, right? Anybody who's living in Detroit neighborhoods wants their neighborhoods to look nice, right? Wants their neighbors to take care of their property. Uh, and one might think that having nuisance tickets is a good thing because it gets people to be responsible. But these nuisance abatements tickets have a price tag, right? And it's a very accelerated way to then flip that land from being privately owned to publicly owned, right? And the most important picture I put up two weeks ago was that picture that shows Detroit from the air and shows how many parcels are out there, right? And until we get this whiz-bang machine, I gave you the cat in the hat image of trying to go and clean up this whole house with this important machine, that machine has to flip land from privately owned to publicly owned, right? Uh, then has to aggregate that land into big swatches, and then has to spit that land out for quote-unquote development purposes. Right? And that's really the sequencing of event that we're seeing uh, within a lot of these plans. Right? Uh, what happens to the people living there? Right? So think about that. Right? Somebody's living in a house, they don't get their blight removal, or, or their, their, their nuisance abatement tickets, they lose their house. Right? Uh, and what you see is a broader pattern that we're going to raise up and we'll continue with our speakers tonight uh, of displacement, right? So as I'm grabbing land, I'm displacing people, right? I'm grabbing land, I'm displacing people. So what's happening with the tax foreclosure crisis, right? All of those homes, right, who are not current on their taxes are going to find out the overassessment problem uh, is a serious one tonight. Those people lose their homes, right? Where do they go, right? What do we do with the displacement? Uh, water shutoffs, another thing that we're going to have tonight. Uh, people who can't pay their water bills are having their water shut off. Right? Tens of thousands of households having their water shut off. Uh, yeah. What happens to those people? sign that says the bus is here. So let me say about, uh, uh, about two more minutes to transition it back. Uh, I'm going to let you guys solve the mic problem. I'm going to drop the mic or I'm going to hand the mic over. Uh, land and people. Right? Land and people. If we're getting all of these things that are grabbing up land and we're displacing people, what's our future looking like? So go back to that visioning exercise. So if we're going to move beyond development, what's the pathway to get us there? So we're talking about community empowerment tonight, right? So last week was kind of dismal, right? We're talking about all these awful things happening. Uh, tonight we're going to introduce you to people in the community that are fighting back uh, and giving us examples uh, of ways that we're not disempowered, ways that we can be acting and taking care of our own destiny. But a critical part of that is the visioning part, right? What is the community that you want to be living in, right? What was that picture you had about development and how we're going to be moving beyond that? So that's your segue from two weeks ago to tonight, uh, and I'm going to turn it over, if you're ready, uh, to Eliza. And we'll get the mic set. Okay. So it might make that noise again. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna turn that noise off really quickly, <laughs> if it does. Apologies for the sound system um, issues, but I think this is gonna work. I turned the gain off. It's not an electric guitar, so it should be okay. for being here. Um, I want to acknowledge that the people's state of the city is happening right now, so a response to the state of the city um, that is also happening, that uh, <laughs> is happening at the same time. So we've got a bit of a, a conflict, um, but there's ways to engage. So if you want to follow um, that hashtag, people's SOTC, people's state of the city, um, and get engaged on Twitter after class. Um, I'm sure you will have lots of opinions about what the state of the city is right now that you can add to that um, online conversation. Um, can somebody put up some that too? And I, um, I just got back from Puerto Rico. It was amazing and um, that's a whole nother thing is like um, connecting our struggle in Detroit to the struggle in Puerto Rico. So Monica was with me, so she could probably tie something into um, there. On some level, like they came to us because um, we're, you know, we went through bankruptcy and emergency management before they did. They saw it was coming, and um, their, you know, their fight, their so-called promesa, um, the broken promise of promesa, and um, the emergency management that has visited them. Uh, they wanted to learn from Detroit, and so they came to us in 2016 and 2017 to learn and invited us to, to visit them. So we just got to, to go, and I'm wearing, um, I'm wearing a t-shirt of political prisoners with the, it says Libertad, Freedom. And I'm sorry to have to tell you that we have another political prisoner, another prisoner that has joined the ranks, which is the Watu Salamra. So, the last time I was with you, we spoke about her case, and so many of you came out to support her on March 1st at her sentencing. Thank you for that. It was really, really powerful to see the, pack, the courtroom absolutely packed to the point that they wouldn't let us in, and we packed the hallway. Um, and we were surrounded by deputies from multiple jurisdictions because they saw it on Facebook, and you know, we just wanted to show love. It wasn't even disruptive or anything like nobody. There wasn't a sign. It was just people showing love for this woman, who again is our host. So she's the leader. She's the co-leader of the Cast Commons in EMIAC, the space that we're in, and um, and was criminalized for defending the life of her baby and her mother and her own life, and uh, was sentenced to the ma mandatory minimum. So she was convicted of. Um, felonious assault and felony firearm, and felony firearm has a mandatory minimum that takes the discretion away from the judge. Um, you know, the judge can't weigh in, the prosecutor can't weigh in, they can't take any circumstances into consideration. He had to sentence her to two years in prison. So she was taken into custody on Thursday. Again, she's six months pregnant. So our our prayers and our organizing are organized around five things right now. One is her safety, her safety, the baby's safety um, on all levels. So reproductive safety, her physical health, her spiritual health, her mental health, her emotional health um, in Huron Valley Correctional Facility, which is um, the only uh, current correctional facility. Probably people know um, some stories about that place. Um, so we're organizing around her health, we're organizing around her family's safety and protection and financial security. 
Um, they just lost the breadwinner. So we're gonna, again, be doing fundraising to make sure that her commissary is tapped up, that her family has their bills paid for, that they have childcare, that they have meals. Um, so we're organizing around all of that. Organizing around the legal team, providing um, legal support, organizing support around her appeals, because she obviously is going to appeal, and we're also gonna be asking for a pardon from the governor or a commutation of sentence. So we're exploring every legal option that we have available. And then those are our highest three priorities right now, but also uh, we're in the space that she leads, right? And so the space just lost its director. Um, a co-director, Baba Darrell, was previously in a three-way directorship. We met Baba Darrell on our first night here. Um, and um, it used to be Will C, Will Copeland, Baba Darrell, and Sawatu Salamara. And Will recently stepped out and is really focusing on his art right now. Um, and so a couple months ago, he transitioned out of leadership and it was just Baba Daryl and Sawatu, and now Sawatu has been sent to prison, and so it's just Baba Daryl himself um, in that leadership position when he's always been used to a co-leadership since they started, since those three took over um, the directorship of the, the Cass Commons, they have been co-leaders. And so, um, you know, we need to hold him in our hearts and the staff here and everybody who depends on this place. There are a lot of incredible social justice tenants that are in this space, and a ton of movement activists. It's like pretty much everybody that does justice work in this city meets in this space. So I don't know that it was intentional. I have a feeling that they didn't even have any idea who she was when they prosecuted her, but we know the impact of what taking out one of our major leaders is. And so we have to rally around this space um, and the people that depend on this space and that hold this space up. And then um, finally just, and this is something that she wanted too, she, didn't, she doesn't want this case to be just about her. Um, she talked about how she saw so many people in that court while she was going through her process. Filing, th filing through and pleading guilty to charges is very common in the black community to plead guilty to charges that you did not commit because you don't want to take that risk of that longer prison sentence. And um, she took the risk because she knew she was innocent and she had a lawyer, which is something that most people don't get to have, um, like a, a lawyer that she, you know, she paid for. And, um, and so that, you know, this, this broader, deeper um, injustice that has happened, that happens to the black community just being way over criminalized um, is, and you know, what happens to black mothers and black women um, that's, those broader policy issues are something that we will also additionally be working on through the campaign. So I wanted to give you an update on that. Please hold her in your prayers and your thoughts. Um, we're continuing to fundraise and there will, we're tentatively holding a meeting here next Thursday, March 15th, to um, like announce the ways that you can concretely um, help out. So look forward to that. The, the, the you caring that we sent out before has that has updates. Um, so that's the that's the fundraising website and it has updates. Julie, can you post that on Facebook in the Facebook group too? That would be great. Thank you. I can put them on the website too. Yeah. Thank you, Marianne. Oh, and I pulled this up for a reason. So there was an article that was written about her today that when it was in the Grio, has been shared a lot um, by, um, and it's, it's called Black Lives Matter Co-Founder Seeks Justice for Pregnant Mom Incarcerated Due to Stand Your Ground Law. It's really kind of like in spite of the, the Stand Your Ground Law. So Patrice Cullors um, authored this article about her today. So it's made national news. Um, so please check that out and share it. Um, there's going to be lots of ways to share her story on social media and just send love to her. And I also ask that we're careful about how we, I mean, I really want to do things that send love to her and support her. And um, <coughs> she's inside. Um, I've had this happen to a lot of, I've had this happen to other clients of mine that um, were in detention and when they spoke out, um, you know, any little thing that is considered dissent is very threatening to um, law enforcement, and there's retaliation. Um, really, really harsh, ridiculous levels of retaliation and violence against prisoners who, di who just want their rights. And so we have to be really careful about how we talk about 
her case and not be sort of like, you know, this is like the system. So like a lot of people really want to attack the judge and, and that sort of thing. But we're really saying, you know, it's the mandatory. He didn't even have a choice. I mean, he had some choices, but the mandatory minimum took his discretion away. If there's a systemic problem and we need to kind of, we need to address that and not, um, and not do personal attacks right now that anybody that could cause a retaliation against her inside. So please be mindful of that when you engage in social media, because they are watching us. That's why there were that many deputies there um, on Thursday. So, what an amazing panel tonight. I wanted to, um, I wanted to do a little bit of framing in terms of thinking about, again, how this, how these, um, Issues tie into like what we can learn from the indigenous experience. I think it's always really important to come back. So not just in the beginning, but to just constantly be weaving the indigenous perspective in. And there's a couple of reasons I think that's really important. One is just out of respect, because we're in indigenous land. And um, I can't imagine like if we were, you know, in, in somebody else's house and just talking about all of these problems and not talking about how the problems happened to them first. And, uh, and they're just like not included in the conversation at all. We just like go into their house and like talk about our problems and don't talk about theirs um, in their house. And that's, that's often what happens when we forget um, that indigenous people, um, you know, encountered these problems first, these issues of race first and are still here listening to our conversations about them. So out of respect, we have to acknowledge and just out of strategicness, we have to acknowledge because if we know what happened before, we're a lot better at predicting what is happening now and like what's problematic about what's happening now. And we're also a lot more, it allows us to build strategic alliances with each other because we understand like this happened to us and it's happening to you. We should be together in this. So, <laughs> so um, you know, I think about 1492 and like what that has to do ha has to do with now. I um, there's this there's this card. I like to tell the story about this postcard that um, really brilliant postcard that I, I don't know if it was Diram Monica if you know or if, sorry if you know who did that. But it was a card and it said this is racism then and now. It was a postcard and it's and it had it was on my kitchen table. My son was 10 years old at this time, and it's got um, it's got a the water fountains. It's got the water fountains for white people, and it's got a sign, a, sign, a picture of water fountains um, that it says for colored people. And um, he looked at that, and he was, he, you know, he just read it out loud. I was like, oh, what do you think about this? He's like, I said, what, do, what message do you get when you, when you see, um, you know, those? They were very two different water fountains. Like one was a nicer water fountain, and one was like a really like jacked up water fountain. And I said, what's the message you get from the one that says white? And he's like, that's a really nice fountain. And like, so I would get the message like that I'm a good person. And what's the message you get if you're told you have to drink out of this other one? Like that I'm not worth anything. Um, it's not a good one. And if you look at it and next to that one, like you wouldn't want to and you would feel bad about yourself that you had to drink out of that. And then the next picture was um, a house in Detroit, a super blighted, you know, neighborhood. And, um, and then the one next to that, or you know, in relationship to it, was the Opportunity Detroit, um, you know, advertising. And so I said, so what do you see if you had to live this with your neighborhood, and it was like totally blighted and run down like that? Like, how would you feel about yourself? And he was like, like again, like I'm not worth anything, and you know, I don't deserve better, and they don't want me to have better. And then what do you see in Opportunity Detroit when he's like? That looks good. <laughs> He's like, you know, and so I don't know if you, you've seen that, but it's just sort of like this glossy view of downtown, and I think there might have been some people in like a horse-drawn carriage, and there's some people outside that are like happily eating, and like, you know, like women crossing the street in dresses that are like swaying in the wind. And I was like, yeah, they do look happy, huh? So who do you see in that picture? Um, and he's like, well, I'm like, Think about like who lives in Detroit right now. Does that look like the people that live in Detroit right now? And he's like, well, it's a lot of white people. There's, I was like, is there anybody who's like black? Cause you know, Detroit's like over 80% black. He's like, mm, I think there's somebody who thinks he might've found somebody. And I was like, so this is representing gentrification. 
you know what that is? He's like, no. And I'm like, well, so it's kind of like when, you know, you have a neighborhood that you've lived in for a really long time and you take care of it and you plant gardens and you paint your house if you can and you really try to fix it up. And then other people are like, for good reason, they're like, ah, I love your neighborhood. So beautiful. And you're like, yeah, I know, right? And, and so, like, you're happy that they, like, notice that you, like, try hard even though you're really poor. Um, but you really try hard to do something with your neighborhood and like it's home to you like even though you're poor it's your it's your home and you've known your neighbors for a really long time and you know your family lives there and then they come in and a lot of people like don't intend to be disruptive when they come but they just they're so excited because they want to be by you that they you know they start buying houses there and they start paying more for the houses than you can pay for and then there's other people that intend to actually make people pay more for the houses that you pay, that you can pay, so that you have to leave. And you have to leave the neighborhood that you've always been in. And you're the one that has been there for decades, making it really good. And it's cool to share, and it's cool that new people want to come in, but like maybe they should think about how they come in so that, because sometimes they come in and they start making new rules about what you can do and what you can't do. And like, we're gonna close this street off and nobody can drive on it anymore. And they start changing all the laws around the neighborhood to the point that the people that made it an awesome place to live have to leave. And they sometimes make them un feel uncomfortable and all these things happen. So what do you think about it? He's like, that's not cool. And I'm like, does that sound like anything that ever happened before, like maybe a really long time ago? He was like, oh yeah, the colonies. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, my son gets an attack! <laughs> and uh, my dad's here tonight. So then he starts going, actually, well, because he started talking about like the 1600s, right? And then he was like, actually, 1492 and blah, 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 and then Costa Rica. And then he starts naming all these things. I was like, okay, you didn't get this from school and you didn't get it from me. I called my dad. I was like, my dad. <laughs> and he was like, because Diego tells me, I, dad, Grandpa used to read to me. My bedtime stories, that's how come I know that. And my dad had been reading to him like the indigenous people's history of the United States and at four. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Dad, for that. So another lesson, read to your kids. They're, they're getting all of this. They can connect these dots. Things have happened like... Uh, things have happened like that we talk about, like we talk about 75, right? Cutting through Black Bottom and also cutting through um, Southwest Detroit, the ways that it divided up neighborhoods and completely displaced neighborhoods. Um, that happened to the Potawatomi. So we're in Potawatomi territory, right? Three Fires territory. They're, after they got displaced and put on a reservation, where you think they'd finally get to just be able to do what they want, um, I found this little snippet where they talked about wanting to build a road right through it, and they did. Built a, and, they, and they said, so check it out, we're gonna tell them that this road is gonna be awesome because they're gonna get to drive to the next, to the next village and be able to trade with their friends and they're gonna love this road. It's like gonna make things so good for them. But what we're really gonna do is we're gonna settle white people all alongside this road on the Indian reservation. We're gonna settle white people and we're gonna start taking over all that land and hopefully they'll just leave because this whole thing that they do where they like migrate and they like, they're nomadic, is they, these savages are driving us crazy, they won't settle. We need them to settle down. So if they're not gonna settle down, they can just leave and we're gonna have this road. So they use that as a strategic tactic to displace indigenous people and they've continued to use it against black people <laughs> and Mexican people in Detroit. There's another example of, um, I got these from Shiloh Maples. She works at American Indian Health. She's also Anishinaabe, Three Fires woman. Um, recently she did a food sovereignty presentation and she showed us like this slaughter of buffalo. They killed all the buffalo so that the indigenous people wouldn't have anything to eat. So they took out their food supply. And it's like, you remember those pictures of Abu Ghraib where it was like people, there's like a tower of people and they were like standing above them like loading? That's what it made me think of because it's this tower of buffalo and there's just somebody up there, like these slaughtered buffalo. Then there's somebody just up there standing like loading over it. Like we took away their food. And that's genocide. And when you think about how, you know, you need food, you need clean air, you need water. You take away those things from people to this place and to commit genocide against them. So are we seeing that today? There was a case up in Northern Michigan that she also told me about 
where how this happened. So they indi indigenous people there were like 19 families in a village that somehow got ta foreclosed on. They didn't pay their taxes. Now this is it, right? Indigenous land, right? So like they shouldn't have taken the land from them anyway. Then they probably made them buy it back. And then they said you owe taxes on it. Why they weren't paying taxes? Why European people weren't paying the taxes to the indigenous people? You know. No, the indigenous people had to pay taxes to the European people, and there was a developer who paid the police to burn the village down so that he could develop it. And that makes me think about the tax foreclosure crisis in Detroit right now. All of these things you'll hear about today. So these precursors um, that happened to indigenous people is what's happening to black people in Detroit. It's the same thing. And if we don't recognize it ahead of time, you know, we're not ready to fight. It's just the same thing. Like we know, we know that black people weren't allowed to learn how to read under slavery, right? That was like illegal. And you see the way that education is being devalued and that people are not being taught how to read in our public education institutes. Like it, it should make you think. It seems like the same thing. So when we know our history, we're better prepared to see the attacks that are happening and to create creative challenges to, uh, to fight back and to resist and to create a beloved community. So with that, I would like to ask Monica Lewis Patrick to take the mic and tell us what you're seeing and how you're, how you're fighting back to create a beloved community, make sure everybody has what they need. Peace and blessings, everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Lewis Patrick, and I have the honor and privilege of serving the citizens of Detroit and beyond uh, as the executive director and president of We the People of Detroit. Uh, our work has always been centered in people first. Uh, we are unapologetically led by an all black women uh, board. Uh, the Every woman within themselves is a powerhouse. So I have to say that first of all. I get the honor of being sort of the baby sister that gets to do all the talking, and I get a lot of the attention, uh, but I can tell you that the other women are more than holding their own fair share of this work around justice for water, justice for housing, uh, the restoration of pensions, uh, the struggle for voting rights. Um, anywhere where there's an injustice, we sort of consider ourselves almost like uh, the League of Justice, if you will. We want, to, we want to connect our struggle to every struggle on the planet because what we believe that Detroit embodies is the, every struggle that's happening on the planet. Uh, I'd also just want to thank Eliza and, and truly echo honoring indigenous lands and where we stand. I um, also want to honor if there are any elders in the room, um, our space and opportunity to be able to speak. And then I also just want to give tribute to the two sisters on my left and my right, uh, Sister Sarita and Dr. Bernadette, who just are amazing women that are doing exceptional work every day in this city. And so thank you for what both of you do. Uh, it's just an honor to sit here with you. But our work is, is truly, as Eliza said, is based on belovedness. We believe Detroit is beloved Detroit. And the reason we say that is belovedness is not just about loving someone or something uh, is dearly loving someone and something and that's how we view the city of Detroit but more importantly the people of Detroit. Detroit is only Detroit because of Detroiters. Okay and so when we talk about Detroit we always remind folks we are the people that put the world on wheels. We are the arsenal of democracy. We are folks that continue to wage against all obstacles uh, building and creating ways out of no way. And so the work that we've done, we see it as a continuation of great sheroes and heroes in this city, like the Honorable Coleman Alexander Young, uh, the work of uh, the great woman and, and legislator Irma L. Henderson. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of one of our queen mothers and our direct advisor, Dr. Joanne Watson. Uh, the amazing research work of Mama Aneb, Dr. Gloria House, and so those elders are still investing in creating policies and programs and doing research that is really countering the narrative in this city that uh, black folks couldn't lead themselves, 
that uh, failed leadership caused the demise of this city, that it was because of failed leadership that you had to take the city into bankruptcy. And what we want to remind you is that that's not true. Uh, if you just look at the water system of the city of Detroit, we sit on 20% of the world's fresh water. 23% of the commerce that comes into the country comes in by way of Detroit. We sit on international waters. You also have to look at the fact that we, at the height of the water department, provided water to 4.3 million Michiganders. Right now, uh, you have about 3.8 million Michiganders. Almost half the state of Michigan is getting their water from the city of Detroit. But out of the 126 municipalities and townships that that system provides water to, the harshest water shutoff policies are landing on Flint and Detroit. So the very people that built the system, that are indebted for the system, that are still paying for the system, can't drink from their own well. And so what we decided in uh, 2014 is that even though we have primarily been working on water, I mean on education and working on policies that were creating uh, new systems and gutting the charter of the city, we knew that when they arrested our sister and our comrade Charity Hicks, that it became personal. That the arrest of Charity, because she just was knocking on her neighbor's doors to alert them that they were in jeopardy of not having access to water, put her in a Mount Correctional Facility. So she went directly to prison for just knocking on her neighbor's doors to tell them that their water was about to be shut off. And then shortly after that, she was, uh, in our minds, was assassinated in New York, uh, where she was preparing to give a speech on what was happening here, the systematic shutting off of water, entire neighborhoods. So you have over 100,000 households in the city of Detroit that have been shut off from water. You now, because of emergency management, have major entities that have been privatized. Your Department <coughs> of Human Services, Workforce Development, uh, your water department now is under the jurisdiction of an oversight entity called Great Lakes Water Authority. So in the very city that was forced in 1955 to indebt itself to building out a water infrastructure to the rest of the suburbs, because we were the only city with the bonding capacity to do so, now finds itself unable to afford to drink from its own water system. And so we had to create several things quickly. We had to be able to use messaging in terms of our young people with their poetry and their hip hop music abilities to get our narrative out to the public because no one locally was paying it any attention. We used videos and we used social media to create messaging. We also were a part of bringing in the United Nations to be able to bring a national an international focus to the egregious acts of cutting off tens of thousands of people from access to water. We also knew that if you don't have running water for 72 hours, you're in imminent danger of losing custody of your children. And regardless of what people would like to stereotype poor people, poor people love their children too. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's the, the most valuable thing that you have in terms of some hope that there will be a brighter future. And so with that struggle of wanting to make sure that people were able to keep their children, also knowing that Detroit up until 1997 had the highest home ownership per capita in the country, what we knew is that water shutoffs and the increase of water, water increased in the last 10 years to the tune of about 126% was driving people out of their homes. And what we know is that when water debt is transferred to the county, it is lumped in as a tax. So because you don't have the separation in terms of those two categories, you're supposed to not be able to take someone's home because of water debt. But the dysfunction of the system lent itself to a capitalist agenda to be able to privatize Detroit's water. Mm -hmm. If the largest asset that we had was the water system, and you had the ability to restructure that debt and reduce it by two-thirds, why would we not do that? But during the bankruptcy, you had them intentionally leave out the largest asset and then advise Flint to disassociate itself 
from the Detroit water system in order to drive Detroit into debt. So this was never about fixing the finances of the city. It was about seizing control <coughs> over the city. And so now what we begin to do is especially around water is that when Flint became the sort of, uh, I guess the international rally cry that there was lead contamination, not only in Flint, but all across the country, especially throughout the Rust Belt, um, then you had people paying more attention to the water issue. But then recognizing that there was recent research done at Michigan State University that says that 36% of America in the next five years will not be able to afford their water. It wasn't until the activists began to intersect their struggle that our immigrant uh, brothers and sisters were finding themselves unable to advocate for themselves to get their water turned on because of language barriers, then there began to be some connections created there. When we found out that there were elders in the city that were having difficulties because they once had a pension of $19,000 and now that pension had been stolen from them and reduced by at least 20% and their health care costs had gone from about $150 a month to $500 upwards to $1,000 then we had no other choice but to deputize ourselves and begin to create systems to share our water. So you'll find in Detroit that there are water hoses running from house to house because people cannot afford to get on a system that already has crippled them with the debt of expanding it to the suburbs. You have Detroiters actually paying retail for water while all the suburban customers are paying wholesale. The markups are happening in their own municipalities to the tune of 100% markup all the way up to 1,000. But because we have these very deep racial divides in Michigan, it's very easy to just explain it away that it was failed leadership in Detroit. And what I would hope that if there's anything that you garnered from my comments and the things that I've said is that you would be willing to analyze and pick apart these narratives. Because when you're continuing to let a lie stand, then what happens is a narrative is created that is truly harmful to the very people that have actually held this city together. Detroiters are not asking permission to be. We have a right to be. I think what people would find is that some of the most loving and endearing people on the planet in this city. You will find that crime has steadily gone down for 10 years while at the same time there was a narrative created that there was extreme crime and uh, violence rampant in the city. You had pervasiveness in terms of lights being turned off in the city that created a mindset that there was crime, while at the same time you could have turned on 85% of the lights in the city for $2 million, but they used that lie to indebt us to DTE and to corporate interest to a tune of over $200 million. And so now we have a third of the lights we had before, and we owe over $200 million when we could have turned on 85% of them for $2 million. Who is making these decisions? So you've got Detroit right now on the brink of a second bankruptcy. While there is partying and bottle popping and water flowing downtown. And now you're sitting on one of the biggest epidemics in southeastern Michigan as it relates to hepatitis A. Legionnaires, cholera, shiganella. These are waterborne diseases, are diseases and infectious diseases that are related to not having proper water and sanitation. You cannot call yourself a first class nation and have these kind of third world conditions. And you have the ability to solve these problems if we would be willing to unite in speaking truth to power. Nobody is going to dub you your turn. As a matter of fact, you may have to fight and claw your way to some spaces to make sure that you're heard. We're in a right now moment and nobody's ever been here before. And we're excited about the lessons learned from those before us because truly they pay a great price. But we need an intergenerational, intersected movement in this right now moment. The things that I'm seeing and hearing from people in positions of power and influence is frightening. 
And anyone that would tell you that this is all laid at the feet of the GOP is not telling you the truth. You have Democrats in this state at the local, state, and federal level that co-collaborated and conspired to put, put communities of color in these predicaments. But if we allow them to silo us in these issues or silo us based on our ethnicity, they will win. They will kill us in our silos. And this is truly what we're seeing in the city of Detroit. But the revolutionary spirit of Detroit will not die. You have people in this city that have cut 20 and 30 lawns. They shovel their entire block. Many times the city doesn't come. The police don't come. They have created some of the greatest urban gardens in the world. It is the capital of the world. There are freedom schools. You have elders that have initiated freedom schools in the 60s and still running freedom schools in this city till this day. Because there's a liberation in our spirit that we don't deserve to live under this oppression. So even if our bodies are incarcerated just like Sawatu, our minds and our spirits are free. This is what people are coming from all over the world to try to market and capitalize off of. When you look at Puerto Rico, some of the same players, Judge Rhodes, Jones Day, Veolia. When you talk about the divorces, don't act like you can't connect the dots that, Mike, that Eric Prince, who is a part of Blackwater, is training Dan Gilbert's security guards. Why would you need that level of mercenary training in this city? When you look at the fact that the divorces have instrument, been instrumental in privatizing public education in this city, and they are deeply connected to the privatization of water because the divorces sit on the board of Veolia. Veolia is connected to privatizing trash in Detroit and Flint and in Macomb County. You have to connect the dots that Jones Day, one of the largest law firms on the planet, is the legal advisor to Veolia, to Snyder, to the Detroit News and Free Press. This is the kind of analytical thinking that they don't want us to have. And this is what scares them. One of the things that my mother reminded me of when I first got in this struggle, she's a 24-year combat veteran, retired from the US Army. And she quoted me chapter and verse of the Geneva Convention. And she said, whether you recognize it or not, you better know that shutting off water is an act of war. It is an act of war. And so I had to make a decision that very day. Was I committed to engage in this war, even if it would cost my life? And some of the conversations I have with my children often are, if they kill me on Monday, you can mourn on Tuesday, but y'all better get up on Wednesday and get back in this struggle. Because your very lives depend on you, caring enough that your humanity, your very humanity must embrace the fact that every person has a right to safe, affordable housing clean, safe, and affordable water, and the ability to determine their destiny. It is up to us, every person, to be a part of shaping that future. Coleman Young said it, and I believe it, he said it best. If you find a good fight, get in it. All of these fights are worth getting in. Okay. <laughs> Monica, and I'm under strict instructions uh, to send Mama Monica home because she's not well and she needs to take care of herself. So thank, thank you, you so for much. being here and giving your all. Um, next, um, Lily, please to introduce Professor um, R. 
Damon J. Keith visiting scholar, Professor Bernadette Atuahene, who is, um, in her words, an expert in how white people take away black people's land. And she studies that globally, so from South Africa to Detroit. She's an expert in this. Um, and she's come here, she's been this past year with us at the Key Center at Wayne State University Law School, teaching our students and engaging in a deep, deep struggle and fight in Detroit for um, the right of people to stay in their homes and to protect them from tax foreclosure. So thank you for all of the incredible work that you've done and please, we're so, I can't wait to hear more about it. Thank you, I want you so much. having me. My problem is always being too loud, so yeah, you don't want me on that mic. <laughs> all right, so um, as Eliza was saying, I actually, all my work has to do with stolen land from people in the African diaspora. Um, my prior work for the last decade, I've been working in South Africa, doing a study of land restitution there, and I actually came to do, and I think about that as stealing from above, right? The colonial and apartheid government stealing from the indigenous people of South Africa. And that was a very uncomfortable project for me in many ways because we look, it was looking at poor people as victims. And so I wanted to look at a situation of stolen land, but not as poor people as victims, but instead as the aggressors. So I came to Detroit to actually study squatting and say, you know, poor people taking over land, uh, claiming it because they need it against the law. Because Detroit, many of you may, may know this, that Detroit has one of the largest squatting phenomenons happening in, in recent American history. The last squatting phenomenon that even somewhat touched what was happening in Detroit was on the Lower East Side of New York. But what's happening in Detroit far outpaces that. So as I was studying the squatting phenomenon, uh, there's two kinds of squatters in the law. What we call, what well, you all probably think of a squatter, what we call a takeover. That's people who come into a property with no prior legal relationship to that property. But in the law, there's also holdovers. And those are people who once had some prior legal relationship to the property, but they either got foreclosed upon they, and they stay. So they were once owners and now they become squatters. So for my study, I had to really include both kinds of squatters. And when I started interviewing the holdovers, that's when I came across the property tax foreclosure crisis. And, um, and what I found was, was, was really uh, outrageous. And uh, before I went to law school, before I went into the academy and became a professor, I was an organizer in South, South Central Los Angeles. And uh, I always say, you can't come across some foolishness like this and keep going with, a, with, orga with, a, with a, an organizer's heart. And so I had to put the book about squatters aside and now I'm focused on this work on property tax foreclosure. And our findings of our study are astonishing. So the first finding is the Michigan State Constitution is very clear. It says that no property should be assessed at more than 50% of its market value. Other state constitutions, to the extent they even mention property tax assessments at all, say things like it has to be uniform, fair, equal, which are all nebulous standards up to a court to determine legality. It's only Michigan and two other states that actually have a ratio, and Michigan's is it can't be more than 50%, which means that people like me can come in and run the numbers and determine legality, and that's exactly what we did. We ran the numbers from 2009 to 2015, and our first finding is in each of those seven years, anywhere between 55 and 85% of properties were being assessed in violation of the Michigan State Constitution. What years were those? between 2009 and 2015. All right, and we can put the paper on uh, the Facebook page or what have you as well. So th that's the first thing. So the second thing is, okay, you're assessing people when, you, when, when assessments are high, that means that necessarily your property tax bill will also be inflated. And so many of you may not know that between 2011 and 2015, one in four properties in Detroit has been subject to property tax foreclosure. One in four. We haven't seen this number of property tax foreclosures in American history since the Great Depression. And of course, now that I just told you about these illegally inflated property tax assessments, you can put, the, you can put one plus one equals two together here, right? So the next piece of it is then we said, okay, well, who is being unconstitutionally assessed? Exactly who is it? So we broke the data up into what we call five quintiles. All that means is from quintile one, our lowest value homes, all the way to quintile five being the highest value homes. 
And we found in quintile one and two, the lowest value homes, 95% or more of homes were being assessed in violation of the Michigan Constitution. But when you get to quintile five, the highest valued homes, guess what percent of those homes are being assessed in violation of the Michigan Constitution? Give me a guess. Zero. 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 Okay, now y'all do it. Five. 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 Right? And that has everything to do with the fact that people with higher valued homes often have more money, right? So that means that they're, they, they can protest their taxes by hiring lawyers or other intermediaries. They often have more education and know how to, uh, to protest their taxes on their own. So the differential has everything to do with who has the ability and information to protest their taxes and who does not. So that, that's what's happening here. And it's the, the very people who cannot afford these illegal assessments, who are being illegally assessed because they're vulnerable, right? It's their vulnerability that is causing them to get over-assessed, and it's their vulnerability that's also the source of their lack of resistance to that over-assessment. The third piece of this uh, first puzzle is that 40% uh, of Detroiters live under the federal poverty line. And if you're living under the federal poverty line, you qualify for something called the poverty tax exemption. But in Detroit, to qualify for this, we call it PTE, poverty tax exemption. My word, I mean, this thing wasn't even on the dang internet. You couldn't even pull it off from the internet. They had some crazy numbers on it so that activists couldn't print them. You know, you have a community, a community meeting of 150 people. You couldn't print 150 and pass it out and everyone uh, uh, turn it in right now because each, of, each application, what they made you do is you had to uh, uh, walk in and then when you walked in to get the application, they, would then, they wouldn't even give you the application, they would mail it to your house, yeah. right? And so all these kinds of un completely idiotic, <coughs> unnecessary systems. I don't want to say a bad word, but there's children. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Foolishness. Foolishness, right? And 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 so so we have a lot of Detroiters who so what so what does this leave us? We have a situation where the vast majority of Detroiters are being unconstitutionally assessed. This is leading to illegally inflated property taxes that people cannot afford to pay. And so they're being subject to property tax foreclosure at record rates for property taxes they weren't supposed to be paying in the first place. My God, right? That's right. That's what's happening in Detroit. So that's the first piece of the study is we really, and, and, and as I always say, people didn't need uh, us to come in and do a study. People on the ground knew that this stuff was high. It was unreasonable. You know, people, people know their taxes are high. The value of our study is it really pointed to the fact that not only was it high, but it was illegal, number one. And number two, it, just, it says it in a language that, they, they, that when you do empirical work, it's a language that certain populations can no longer ignore, right? Uh, they can no longer ignore. So you're speaking a language that's understood uh, by, by those in power. So that's the first study we did. The second study we did, all right, so the first study, we're kind of dancing around race. The second study, it's attacking race head on. And so the research question in the second study is, the way we organized it is, as many of you know, this is a very black city, over 80% black, and very white suburbs, which is horrible <laughs> and caused by all kinds of reasons. It's terrible, but it's wonderful for me as a researcher <laughs> because I can use this as, uh, 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 as a great uh, 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 kind of testing pool. So what I did is I said, okay, the research question is, are the predominantly black cities in Wayne County being unconstitutionally assessed and subject to tax foreclosures at a greater rate than the predominantly white cities in Wayne County, right? And because of the just extreme racial segregation in Wayne County, I can do that study, right? That's the only thing good about the segregation, <laughs> right? And so what did I find? Yeah, so I was yeah. going to put up my findings, but you guys already know what I found, right? Yeah. Because number one, but it's really, if I would have shown you, so of the six counties, of the six top places that there were foreclosures, basically only one of the six, the kind of last of the six, is Hamtramck, that, but every other city has a majority black population. And when you, and it had like, it's something like 13 
per thousand in Hamtramck, but like in uh, in uh, um, in Detroit and in Highland Park, it's something like 230, right? And so people always ask, well, what's going on in Hamtramck? Why are the white people? Why why is that the only city that's predominantly white that is facing foreclosures? It's like you have to understand Hamtramck. Hamtramck is white, but there's a lot of vulnerability, right? They're Arabs who are in the census white, but very, but very, but immigrants and are poor. And so just like blacks, they too are vulnerable. And this property tax foreclosure abuse happens to vulnerable populations. So once you break it down, you can see why Hamtramck is the only white city in the, in the list of top foreclosures. That's one. So then we looked at the issue of unconstitutional tax assessments. And again, the findings there was, were also astonishing. Of the, I want to say, what, 50, how many county uh, taxing jurisdictions do we count? Something like 50 something taxing jurisdictions. How many? 43. 43, look at you, thank you, baby. 43 taxing jurisdictions. There are, um, of the 43, there were something like, I want to say, 20 that got it right, meaning that their median assessment ratio did not exceed 50% of the, of, the, uh, of the market value of the properties in that jurisdiction. And can I tell you that all 20 were in cities that had a black population of less than one third. Every single city that was doing what it was supposed to be doing was majority, was a predominantly white city. And then when you came to the three, and so I have three categories, kind of uh, legal, cities that are doing it correctly. Second category is kind of illegal, meaning it's somewhere between 0.5 and 0.6, meaning we could debate about it, right? And, 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 and three is severely illegal, there's no debate. It's above 0.6, it's just so clearly, right? And so I broke it up like that because people want to debate me. Okay, you can debate me on the second column, but with third, we're not, we're not going there, right? When you're 0.6 or above, you're like way over the limit. And the three predominantly black cities, Detroit, Inkster, and Highland Park, are all in that third category, the severe, severe illegality category. So we have a situation where the predominantly black cities are not only being subject to unconstitutional tax foreclosures at a greater rate, but also unconstitutional assessments. And that, in that study, we really look at, 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 at what the Fair Housing Act has to do. And so we look at disparate impact. Because to make a, a claim about the Fair Housing Act, I won't get into that too much, but the point is you have to prove disparate impact, and the evidence of disparate in, impact is strong. Right, so let's, so let's just say that. So that was the second paper, is to deal directly and kind of squarely with race. The third and final paper has not been released yet, but it's the doozy of the doozies. <laughs> so the first two papers, it's mostly something called assessment ratios. It's basically, literally, market value, assessment, assess value over market value. It's ratios. I can do that math. I'm not a mathematician. But for this third paper, we actually need a theoretical model. So I had to co-author it with an economist from the University of Chicago. Why? Because the question in the third paper is, of the illegal assessments, what percent? We want to measure the effect of illegal assessments on foreclosure rates. Does that make sense? So that means that there are lots of things there are lots of things that cause people to go into foreclosure, right? What are some of those things? You yell out some of those things. Like you, lose your, you lose your job, some death in family, medical, sick, medical, sick medical, 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 right? So the point is we have to do a model that controls for all of that so that we can isolate the effect of unconstitutional assessments on the foreclosure rate. So that, you need theoretical modeling to, to, to do that. So we did that. And of course, all the work we do, we do the most conservative estimates because we know, you know, people are coming for us. Mm -hmm. So everything we do, we do with it. I can explain uh, into the kind of uh, empirical strategy, but it is literally the most conservative strategy possible. And our finding in the third paper really kind of, it even surprised me. The finding in the third paper is that we're able to say that 10% of all between, let me, let me, let me say this properly. Between 2011 and 2015, 10% of all foreclosures were caused by unconstitutional tax assessments. And because of this thing I told you about earlier, where the lower valued homes are assessed more severely, uh, 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 more illegally than other homes, if we're just looking at low valued homes, one in four of those homes would not have gone into foreclosure but for 
this illegal assessment. So this third paper really kind of just shakes it up and, and really, more than any of this work, that third paper opens up this conversation about reparations. Because you can't just be engaging in this foolishness, right? And just be on some old oops. We got it wrong. Oops, right? There's no oops to this. With some compensation and start a conversation about reparations. And this third paper about where we're able to measure the effect, because in there we can say, no, you know, like, I, I, I did, because I, it's part of my work, I also interview all the kind of officials. And, I, and I'm not going to say his name. Maybe I will. Dave Shemansky. And... <laughs> It was a public interview, so I'm going to be public with it. Some of my interviews are private. But uh, I asked him, so, you know, what do you think is going on? And I promise you, you know, it took everything in me to just, like, sit, be still, Virgil. I was, I'm a prayer woman. I had to pray out. I said, like, Lord, help me not choke this man. <laughs> he literally said, well, you know what, Professor? What's happening is when people had a choice between buying a purse and paying yes. their taxes, uh -huh. unfortunately, yes. they decided to buy the purse. Yes. Uh -huh. I don't know what to tell you. To tell you. I said, Ooh, Lord, Lord Jesus, help me. <laughs> you know? And it's these types of narratives of blaming the poor. We don't, we don't only see them in the property tax foreclosure context. These are the narratives of blaming the poor that exist in all, in, all the, in various different areas. And our job about those people who care about structural racism, because this is a quintessential example of structural racism, what's happening with, these property, uh, with property tax in Detroit. Those of us who care about structural racism have to do the work of shifting the gaze from the individual to the structures, right? It's not about someone deciding to buy a purse. It's about these systemic unconstitutional assessments, these barriers you're putting into getting the poverty tax exemption. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're looking at Ms. Jones and, 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 and thinking, oh, her shoes are too nice. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about your shoes. I'm not worried about your purse. Mm -hmm. I need to be worried about doing my damn job Definitely. and getting these property tax assessments correct. Mm -hmm. But that's our job, is shifting the public gaze, shifting the conversation from this destructive narrative about individual accountability, about individual individualized assessments, to, to focusing on these structural uh, issues. So my time is running out, so I just want to end by saying some hope. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, this research is really depressing. It's like, dang, it's depressing. All right, what's not depressing is the resistance. So one of the things that we've done is the various organizations in Detroit who have for a long time been working on housing uh, and issues similar to this have formed a coalition. The coalition is called the Coalition to End Unconstitutional Tax Foreclosures. And we have three primary objectives. The first is to stop these illegal assessments. Um, as many of you know, at the top of last year, Mayor Duggan finally did a reassessment of all properties in the city. Things did get better, so that, that is very good. But we redid our study, and we found that homes worth about 20000 and under, 90% or more of those homes are still being unconstitutionally assessed. Uh, and that just has a lot to do with taxes are regressive. That, some of that is not Detroit. That's, not the, that's just a, what happens in general. Lower valued homes are just hard to value. But we found a way to do an across the board cut for all lower valued homes to make sure that this is no more. We've handed it to the chief of Celsa, Alvin Horn, and we're trying to see if he, he, he needs to enact this thing or give us a reason why not. But that's our first thing. We have to stop these unconstitutional assessments. Our second goal is to have, in this 2018 upcoming tax auction, zero occupied homes going into that 2018 tax foreclosure auction, period, end of story. <laughs> third and final goal is what we talked about. This last piece I just is about reparations. Yeah. You know, so we started this um, program. It's called the Dignity Restoration Housing Program. And we already have two houses. It's not much, but NCST, National Community Stabilization Trust, has given us, you know, allowed us to buy houses for a dollar. And the point is, we can get 15 houses over the year. It's not about the 15 houses, but it's we're going to give these houses back to people who were unconstitutionally assessed and who qualified for the PTE. And our goal is to put these people back in these houses and do a lot of press around it as a way to raise awareness that people are losing homes and to really put reparations on the table as, as something viable. To that extent, we're having an um, uh, event on April 21st. Cornell West is going to join us to kind of kick Ooh. off our Ooh. reparations Ooh. debate or, you know, really kick it off big in terms of putting reparations on the table. We'll put that on the Facebook, too. On the Facebook, I hope you all can come. 
Uh, and thank you so much. I'll stop here. of following <laughs> Sister Monica, uh, Professor Bernadette here. Rita, do you want the mic or no? No, I mean, can people hear me? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'm good without the mic. We're, we've, we've had some challenges. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm good without the mic. All right, so we've, you know, just heard uh, from Sister Monica. She is, you know, the bad activist, as I always say. I learned so much from being around both of them. You just heard from Professor Bernadette. She's the activist, academic. I am the practitioner. And so I am the person on the ground supporting other groups doing the work. Um, I have a lot of things to dazzle and amaze you with, but I am going to talk about how we are working to get people really engaged in all of the issues that are talked about here and how we're going to really move people forward. So I'm with CDAD, Community Development Advocates of Detroit. Anyone here familiar with CDAD other than Brother Will? <laughs> All right, I got a couple of them. Okay. okay. CDAD is a membership organization of community development and uh, neighborhood improvement groups. So block clubs, your community, the CDO. Historically, our organization started as the groups that were the nonprofit developers. They are the groups working in neighborhoods to say, these are the things we want to see in our neighborhood. We have expanded that now because we recognize that even a block club has the same type of issues. But there are a few things that we're doing when we talk about this issue of equitable development, equity, what are we doing around that? And to really start that off, one of the things we had to ask ourselves is, we want to be really clear, well, what do we mean when we say equity? So one of the fears I have right now in my 20 plus years working professionally in Detroit, and I am a Detroiter, I came back home after school to work. I have never heard equity talked about so much. Um, and not only that, and I've been working with and in community for 20 years. I'm getting concerned it's becoming a buzzword. Now, any time I'm on a panel, any conference I go to, everyone wants to be talking about equity. And it's you know, kind of a checklist. We're for equity. Well, what does that mean? So when we talk about it in the community development context, we're very specific to say, as a CDAT, we're talking about racial equity. So in a city like Detroit, when I first started to see that, one of the things I could not believe, and you've already heard it mentioned, I'll mention it a third time because it's worth repeating, that the city of Detroit is more than 80% black. The leadership in community development did not reflect the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. Community development, to me, started as a movement. It started in neighborhoods. It started with people saying, this is what we want. We are claiming, reclaiming the power to make the decisions on what happens in our neighborhoods. And so when a city like Detroit, if it comes from the community, it should reflect the community. And that's not happening. So for us, equity talked about community residents being able to make the decisions to advocate on their own behalf, to say what's going to come. This is a really big, important issue. Community is extremely important in Detroit right now because of all the investment and development that's happening. And we always want to be clear in community. And one thing I always like to joke, by nature, my personality is just kind of laid back. That's just how I am. I, you know, people take on different roles in the family. I'm that person in the family. So I always get the, you know, the feeling, they tell me that too, community development. If you represent community, there's always this expectation I'm going to come in the door, you know, turn over tables, you know, trying to wreck the joint. When we talk about community development, everyone, there's not a person that we represent, there's not a member that we have that says we don't want our neighborhood to be improved that we don't want stores, that we don't want investment. But what we're saying that we want, we don't want it to happen with displacement. And it doesn't have to. And I always say it's about being intentional. And I don't want us to look up in five years, and I feel like that we're on this track, and that people don't care that we're on this track, to look up and just be like, oh, wow, you know, look how the neighborhood's changed. There was nothing we could do about it. Gentrification is never good. The definition I use, so please, you know, we cannot get into this conversation about the, the good parts of gentrification. For me, it means displacing people, putting people out of their homes and saying that everyone who wants to live a certain place is not able to. 
And so that's when we talk about equitable development, that's what we're really about. How are we doing it and what are we trying to do? That's the other big piece about equity. Everybody likes to come and talk about how much they support it. What are you doing? If you have any ability, if you work in an organization, if you control anything, if you're hiring people, what are you actually doing to promote? What are we actually doing to say that we want equitable development in Detroit? For us, it's through policy, community planning, and engagement. So I'm going to talk, I put this map up here. For policy, CDAD is a policy advocate. It's one of the aspects of our organization is how we support our members. Again, we came together on this idea of the strength in numbers. We are stronger as 120 plus organizations representing other hundreds of people in the city than the one organization over in Jefferson Chalmers trying to advocate on what's happening there. Affordable housing is one of our big issues. It's a very big issue when we're talking about development in Detroit. And it's also, you know, we've heard Sister Ma Commission a lot about the narratives, the narratives that are pervasive in Detroit. And one of the narratives is always that when you talk about vacancy and blight, because you feel like you see a lot of vacancy and blight, there's this idea that there's a, a ton of affordable housing. Detroit is affordable. And that is not the case. So one of our issues is affordable housing. We came together around the issue of LIHTC, Low Income Housing Tax Credits. And so those are the tax credits that are typically used to create affordable housing. Our members were taxed years ago to be the affordable housing developers in the city. Because you need a nonprofit developer, you work with a partner, they get the low-income housing tax credits, that's what happens. There's a 15-year window on LIHTC credits. So what that means, that after year 15, if there's not an intention to keep it as affordable, it can flip to market rate. This map, we have an affordable housing work group. We're working with some professors from U of M, Margie DeWar, Lan Pham, uh, some, other, some of our partners and members. We came together to say in the next, right now, in the next three to four years, there are more than 4,000 units of affordable housing that will expire in the city of Detroit. Those dots represent those. Now you see the cluster down in the middle. I know most of you know the city of Detroit map. The majority of them are located in this area, in the midtown, downtown area. The area where most of the investment is happening, the area where we are finding already that uh, rental prices have gone up. And if there is not an investment in that, they could just flip to market rate. Now the other challenge we have, the city of Detroit, you know, coming off bankruptcy, one of the things you know when you live in Detroit, you work with the city, is always the city doesn't have any money. Not only that, what we found is the city didn't have a lot of data. And I'm okay saying this. I used to work for the city of Detroit. I, I used to work in the law department. I'm okay saying this because I, I know what it was like. We pulled together, and we got somebody from HRD, the Housing Revitalization Department, working on this group. But they're like, look, what happened in the city of Detroit, a lot of the knowledge is with the people who work there. And so the city didn't even know where all this was. They didn't know how much money is left, you know, the loans. And the challenge for our nonprofit developers, as you can imagine, the housing game didn't turn out the way it was supposed to. Fifteen years ago, no one could have told them that these units wouldn't go up in value. No one could have told them that there would be this big crash. And so now, unfortunately for them, they're feeling like they are own, you know, slum landlords in their own neighborhoods. They can't reinvest in the property. The values haven't gone up. The rents haven't happened. They don't have the money to pay off the loans. It's a real crisis that we aren't really talking about because unless you're in it, you really don't know about it. So one of the things we're doing is working with this group to say, what are you going to do, city, about this issue, but also generally about an affordable housing plan. And so I understand the city's very excited when they hear that someone wants to do an investment and they can have a condo that's going to be market rate. And, uh, you know, developers are excited. You know, I always say there are people making money in Detroit. Don't be fooled. Um, so we're working on this. The other thing we've been working with, a lot of the work you hear here is coalition work. And so we are making sure that we are part of these coalitions. We are part of the coalition that worked to get an inclusionary housing zone passed. It also included the creation of a housing trust fund. It's a money that can be used to create and preserve affordable housing. So these are the kinds of issues and the work that happens on the ground that you need to get people involved in. 
And we also have to recognize, and I always tell people, I have to appreciate the fact that I get paid, this is the work I do, I get paid to be at a community meeting. I mean, I get paid to work evenings, it's just a part of my job. But people who come out, people in Detroit don't. And so I have to really respect the fact that not, it's a luxury to be able to get engaged. It's a luxury to be an activist sometimes. And so part of what we do as a CDAT to support groups is we want to try to make it easy for people to get engaged. We want to make it easy for you to recognize what are the issues that are impacting you, how can you connect, how can we get you to call a council person, sign on to a letter, say that we support, we're also part of the coalition working on the foreclosure issue. All of this impacts and touches community development. The other two things that we do around, you know, how are we trying to address this issue of real equity and equitable development is around community planning. For many years, before the city of Detroit got back into planning, I know a lot of you know, it wasn't happening in neighborhoods. The city was not actively planning. If you go to any other city, that sounds crazy because they're always planning and working. The city of Detroit was not. We did not have the money, didn't have the resources. But residents were. And so CDAT, many years ago, created a resource, strategic framework to work with residents who were recognizing that our neighborhood is changing dramatically. We have so much more vacancy. We have you know, a lot of blight. But we want to plan for the future of it. We worked with a data partner. So these community plans are resident-led and data-driven. If you go to our website, you can see examples of them. And it is working with residents to say, we're mapping all of the, everything in the neighborhood. So all the vacancy with all the assets, and then we're gonna work with you, and you tell us what you want here. What do you wanna do with it? And helping them think of some future ideas. We have to date worked with seven communities to create plans. Prior to this administration, we were working with the city planning department to incorporate these community plans into the master plan of policies. That's what we want. We want the city to acknowledge what communities want to see, what residents want to see, and take that to be into the master plan of policies. That's not happening right now. Um, it's a new day, and, and the city is now back to planning. We are not, that doesn't mean that we're, you know, we're stopping this work, because we also know that the city is targeting. There's some neighborhoods where they're working currently. There's some where there aren't. In fact, the request for our assistance has increased. Because in the neighborhoods where they're not planning, people want to get organized and be able to tell the city when they come there, this is what we want. The other piece that we are doing around planning, though, is that you've probably heard there's now money for development, investment that the city has to create plans. There's been a number of RFPs issued to make plans, to do projects in certain neighborhoods. Island View, Fitzgerald, uh, Southwest Detroit, they're popping up everywhere. A part of every RFP is a community engagement branch. There's an arm of community engagement that has to happen. And so they're paying people, they're gonna be paying people to work in the, res in the neighborhoods and talk to residents and get them excited about whatever the city's going to do. So when we heard about that, the first thing was like, oh, bet, you should be going to our members. Our members are there, they're engaged, they're active, they are doing community engagement, that's what community development organizations, that what, that's what block clubs and neighborhood improvement groups do. They should be tapped to provide <coughs> community engagement. And so we as CDAT stayed out of it. We're, like, we're not going to do it because we're, we don't compete with our members, we want you to take them. City, you know, a lot of our members did apply and the city is like, no, we will not select one individual organization from a neighborhood to represent and be the community engagement arm. So we're like, okay, now we'll get it. So if you won't take our residents, you know, we won't take our members, we will put ourselves in that because what we don't want to happen is a city to pay an outside firm to come and do engagement in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So right now, we are currently finalists in a number of projects. We've been tapped on one. We're just starting in Jefferson Chalmers. Um, and, this, and I'm honest with people, and I always say, we got to be honest and not be afraid to make mistakes. One of the one things I'm being very clear about with every team that's tapped us, and of course all these teams are outside of Detroit, we want you to know who we are. We are an advocacy organization. We are a membership organization. I'm going to be honest, I am doing this on behalf of our members. This is what our members say they want us to do. But we are very clear we are not going to allow this to conflict with our ability to be a strong advocate. And it should not, because as I always say, this is not, when I'm talking, it's not Sarita 
talking about what I think, although I am a resident, a long time resident, and I have very strong views, but I am representing the views of our membership. And so for anyone in the city to be dismissive of something I'm saying on behalf of CDAC means you're being dismissive of over 120 organizations who are representing hundreds of residents throughout this city. And that's something you will have to explain. And so these are the ways that, you know, we have to, you know, uh, a lot of times it's said to us to see that we are an organization that can be used to kind of play this inside-outside game. Mm -hmm. Because our residents need to be connected to the city because they're doing work. And the city needs to respect them. You know, we always say that the point of our work, you know, internally, when you have to ask ourselves, why are we doing all this? It is to build neighborhood power. You know, we don't have any interest in making a CDAT a strong organization. We want all of our members to be strong organizations. And we want to make sure that the city, that leadership is respecting resident voice. And we want residents to know that you do have the power, collectively. I'll give you the, the last thing I'm going to say because I know I'm last. And we're going to wind down and maybe take some questions. So I'm not going to pretend that it's not hard to stay positive in this work. But recently, the one thing I always tell people that, that's given me the most, uh, you know, made me feel the most excited about this work and given me some hope is the community benefits work. CDAG has been a part of the coalition supporting and fighting for community benefits for going on four years now. And the community benefits fight started with people. It was not our leaders saying that we recognize so as much development is happening in Detroit, as much development is receiving public dollars to do that work, that there should be some benefit to community. No, it was residents demanding that that happen. And even though the ordinance that was passed was not the community's <coughs> ordinance, and this is not a community benefits discussion, so I won't go off the rails talking about how <laughs> shitty that was when the children are gone. <laughs> We are still in the fight. We have an ordinance, and that is something that is rare. And we are already back now planning about how we are going to, if the period is over, we are going to be doing, you know, asking for amendments to that ordinance. So we are committed to making sure that any tax dollars that are used for development, community money, you know, resident money, public dollars, there is going to be a community benefit, for the, particularly for the residents who are going to be, you know, directly impacted by the development. So I'm going to sit down. <laughs> Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions, but one of them that I want to ask um, to both about of you. 15, about 15, we're going to go a little bit over. Awesome, we have time. Great. Um, one of the ones that I want to ask you is that is if people wanted to get involved, are there opportunities for people to get involved in? I know with, with We the People, Monica's uh, group, We the People of Detroit has a, um, a research collective, so there's ways that, that researchers and students can get involved in, in the research. They do water drops, so we go out and just haul water when they get water donations and help give that to people who have their water shut off, so there's all kinds of different ways to volunteer with them. Are there ways to get involved in the work that you're doing? Yes. Uh, and I will flip to the slide that has, so one, of course, we have a website. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. See that membership meetings are open. So if you happen to be in Detroit on the third Wednesday of every other month, the next one will be the third Wednesday of April from 9 to 11 a.m. at Tech Town. You can come to a meeting uh, and find out what we're doing. But yes, please. What time? 9 to 11. Three, was there a The last one. All the, way to the, end. Uh, the other thing too is that so there may be organizations in your neighborhoods and they're likely see that number. So if there's a community development organization, a block club, uh, join them and you'll be connected with CDAD. Do you, CDAD is C D A D hyphen online dot org. And that's my email address and phone number. Do you still have the um, strategic? Um, I remember when that came out, the, the the report, and it was like a tool. It was like a tool yes. kit. Is that still online? And it is still on our website. It's cool. sure. Thanks. And then for the coalition, you can go to illegalforeclosures.org. On that website, you'll find everything: how to get involved, an email, phone number, 
But more importantly, what I'd like each of you to do, especially since so many young people in the room, is we have a video. It's a three minute animated video that in super simple terms explains everything I just explained. It's really a brilliant video. We're trying to make it go viral. We need your help. Go to illegalforeclosures.org. We want as many Michiganders, especially Detroiters first, but Michiganders second, to really use this video to raise awareness so we could really use your help. It's on illegalforeclosures.org. And also on the website we have all kinds of actions you can take um, uh, in the learn more information. We have the studies, links to the study. So that website is really ground zero for all of the uh, activism for the coalition. Great. Um, are you familiar with um, uh, Congress of Community received a uh, contract that Dan Gilbert got to prom um, go into the Delray area and some of the other um, focus areas where they're supposed to let people know about the tax exemption. And they gave them 40 days to go in, um, $10 an hour in the middle of the winter, right, to let people know that this existed, right? And um, the deadline, what is it, the deadline for the, it's like it's April 16th or something? So that's a problem, right? But that's also a leakage. I know that they're still looking for people because there was only a handful at the table trying to, you know, go out into this with these boots and just weather and that kind of thing. Um, but I know that the plan was to like hardcore hit Delray in that area and some of the other focus areas hardcore with these little flyers that Dan Gilbert somehow got contracted to let the public know about. That's the part I don't understand. That's the part that's very confusing to me because if that's a public notice, I don't understand how that's a private entity giving that out. So we are aware of that and the coalition is aware of it. So, <coughs> they were, um, and I don't know all the backstory, a lot of see that members are working with that program to inform people about the property tax exemption. I believe it was Dan Gilbert putting up the money to do it. Um, foundation. Hit, oh yeah, hit the, the foundation. Yeah, it is the foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's funding it. Um, and again, I mean, you know, corporate corporations do those kinds of things for reasons we won't get into. Uh, but yes, our members are working because it is it is important to get more people information about it. As the friend that mentioned though, it's a bit challenging because there's still there's a lot of hurdles to actually getting it. And, and that what you said that we're not gonna get into, that's the part that I'm confused about. And so if we could get into it, that would be helpful for me to understand the landscape a little bit better. So one of the things I'll say, I, I don't know a lot about it, and I don't speak on their behalf for why they're doing it. I just mean personally, it's for me, it's, it's um, obviously, I, I, you know, it's, as I always tell people, it feels like being in a bizarre world. I mean, to have uh, one private business owner own so much property, have control so much, dabble in public, uh, you know, and democratic practices, is disconcerting for me. Uh, as a person, as a resident, and I always feel like more people should be concerned, particularly our city council, um, with the way and the way he can, he has the ability to exert influence and control of the city. I'm just saying, as a, but as a corporation, again, um, they are also painfully aware of sometimes how what their public image is. I think this is an attempt to address just a public concern and have this foundation fund this project. So I don't know if you're also familiar, but we had to upload it into Loveland, and it's like a survey that you take a picture and you go and talk to the people. Um, but then there's the Kresge and the Kellogg that are the hope starts here, focusing on the young child. And so um, if people are interested, we could put it in the notes that this is a occupied home of multi-generational people, and then maybe, I don't know if it's possible to FOIA a private entity on public information, but uh, if we could, then maybe we would have that data already set by the people who are on the ground. I don't know, we talked about that a few times in a few different tables. So, uh, but just being able to use some of these strange ways that we're supposed to go out and get data, but then use them for, uh, to connect them to our other uh, leakages of data that we might need or uh, foresee ahead of time. So the data piece was one thing that the coalition addressed. And with some other members we spoke were very clear and even had it written into the document with uh, um, Rock Ventures that we wanted to make sure that the data was, was could be used by the organizations that were collecting the data. 
-hmm. that we were, and that right. the data would not be misused by rock fish. Mm -hmm. And so that was very clear, um, and I was happy with the way that that worked, the collaborations with the coalition going in and making sure to let them know that we don't want, we're not going to have our members helping to get data for the internal purposes of Rock Ventures, but the organizations who are doing the work. So again, if, if they want to support that, and I didn't dissuade my members because we do need resources to ensure that more people hear about the property tax exemption. I thought it was a travesty that the city's not you know, publicly sharing that information with people. I'm pretty sure that's illegal to not have the city share that with the public. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's public notice. Yeah. They, I, they're, not, they're not keeping it, but I, I feel like they should be working actively to let everyone who knows, and, and they're not doing that. I just want to thank uh, Professor Brandon. Linda Abdwahana has to leave right at 9. So I want to thank you for being here. <laughs> Developers, because of the way Detroit's housing stock, we are so heavy on single family homes um, that affordable housing, just being a sole affordable housing developer, is not the most profitable thing. And like we visited Chicago, it's a very different thing. There's a lot more multi family units that, you know, I talked to some affordable housing, strictly affordable housing developers in Chicago are like, yeah, you can make money, but it's because of the way that the city is designed and their housing. The one thing that, uh, and I'm also like that too. I don't try to, uh, I don't believe in just the inherent good of people doing the right thing uh, anymore. Uh, honestly, it's not really talking to the small developers, it's the bigger developers, where they, they have the profit margins to still make money. Um, and so that's why they like the inclusionary housing is almost so important to set aside 20% for affordable housing. I think the thing we're trying to do now is actually put more of the pressure on the leadership, our government, uh, because they do have a responsibility to us. They do have a responsibility to do the right thing as opposed to the developer. And so one of the things that we're trying to do, when you talk about affordable housing, the AMI in Detroit, the you know, average and median income, it doesn't just look at Detroiters. And so as we mentioned, you know, with 40% of Detroiters living in poverty, our AMI is very different, but it's calculated using other entities. We need to get the city of Detroit. So when they start talking about affordable housing, sometimes they're talking about 60%, 80% AMI. That's really high. But we need people to start thinking about, one of the things I always say and repeatedly, 30% and lower AMI. That's a real reality for a lot of Detroiters. So if you're saying, you know, you're setting aside 20%, uh, you know, at 80% AMI, that's still not affordable. So we need to get people thinking differently about affordability when they're in the city of Detroit. Uh, we need to get leaders to advocate on it. We really fought hard, and we were working with Councilman Sheffield for the Housing Trust Fund to get that 
designated just for 30% lower. They made it 50% lower, which is better than 80%, but we can still do better. So it's more talking about those kinds of things because with the developer, it's really hard on that, I mean, that money game. They, they're trying to maximize their profits. Another question somebody has asked? There was one, one, one back there. Probably the last one. So, from Ms. Sarita. Um, back in 2011, I was evicted, but I wasn't evicted because I moved, I moved out of my home, but I was renting a house from a mortgage company, Royal American Mortgage, four years. After about the fourth year, the taxes wasn't paid on the house. I had to move out, but then I found out I didn't have to move out. But I didn't know what to do at the time, because I'm a single father and I have twin boys. At the time, they were maybe 11 or 10 or something. So I didn't want to have them see us being evicted. So I had to, we moved our stuff out and I boarded it up. But my neighbor said I should have stayed in the house. But at the time, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if there were, I didn't know about squatters' rights or resources or what to tap into in order to keep that house. So if the house is still there right now, but it's, it's, it's like blind, put it like that. So, but is there any kind of way that people can tap into certain resources or knowledge that you actually get put out by a mortgage company that was owned, not from, Somebody in the city, this Royal American Mortgage was out of the suburbs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you hit on a, a really big challenge in the city of Detroit to have it. So, you know, unlike a lot of cities, Detroit has a long history of home ownership. This was a city of home mm -hmm. And what that did, and now we are actually a city of more than 50% renters. Mm -hmm. wow. But we haven't addressed that at the same time. So, unlike you go to see, like, you know, New York, where there are a ton of resources for renters. We didn't create that because we didn't have the need. So the uh, United Community Housing Coalition is probably the best resource. Uh, they're helping and fighting, you know, the lawyers and other resources, helping finding people stay in their homes, fighting against foreclosure, but also beginning to work on some uh, renters' resources. That's also, you'll see a lot of organizations, like we're an organization now trying to work with people to develop rental resources. People just don't know what their rights are. Um, we've never, as a city, even had to do that. So you're right. Because, um, yeah, it was kind of rent to own, because I took yeah. the former person who I rented it from to court. Mm -hmm. And I took them, him to court and the mortgage company. The mortgage company says, don't pay this guy rent no more. Pay it to us. And, uh, and there's a lot of illegality in our housing right now. Um, and so these you know, land contracts, uh, there's a lot of scheming going on uh, because of the big changes. So, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. so we're going to wrap it up for tonight. Thank you so much, Sarita. <laughs>